thought that the earliest published mention of de Grau and his treasure was in 1888. But then we found this. A fictional novel written over 50 years earlier served as inspiration for every tale about de Grau that came after. But a revised edition was published with a foreword written by the author describing the true events on which this story is based. Not in Wallingford, not in Bristol, but on a Vermont mountain called Camel's Hump. You know, with our discovery of May Martin comes a bit of disappointment that the man, de Grau, was likely just a fictional character, and the many legends about him over the centuries were just embellished retellings of that same 1835 fiction. That's how legends are born, though. It starts with a tale, it's told to the children, their children, it spreads throughout the towns and the mountains, and everyone accepts it. But every myth is based on a kernel of truth. And while this new story, the one May Martin was based on, doesn't actually contain a de Grau-like character. The tale is the oldest, probably the most detailed account we've stumbled upon yet, and probably the most believable. The following is read from the author's introduction of the revised May Martin or the Money Diggers, 1852. Having said thus much of the history of the story since its first appearance, I will now proceed to narrate the few incidents with which its origin is connected. Sometime near the close of the French and Indian Wars, the country was still in an unsettled condition, and traveling was unsafe anywhere beyond the outskirts of civilization. A small party of adventurers who had been to Mexico and on their return had landed at the city of Albany undertook to go over land from that city to Montreal or Quebec with a large treasure with which they had enriched themselves during their expedition to the south. Taking the usual route through Lake Champlain or along its borders, then an almost unbroken wilderness, they reached the vicinity of the forts about Midway Lake without much difficulty. But at this point, they became aware of the approach of a party whose object they believed was to plunder them of their treasure. And soon after, they deemed it their only chance of saving their wealth to leave the lake, bury all they had in some secluded spot, and then proceed to Canada. Accordingly, they struck off from the lake to one of the most conspicuous peaks to be seen from their position, easily recognized by themselves or described to those whom they might wish to impart their secret. And here, they buried their treasure. This mountain, could be no other than the one now so generally known by the appropriate appellation of Camel's Hump, which is the most conspicuous peak in the range of the Green Mountains, observable from Lake Champlain and in the vicinity of the old forts. Currently standing on the shores of Lake Champlain, walking the old route in the footsteps of those original adventurers. In fact, this could be the spot. It was decided to hide the treasure under that recognizable landmark. And although there may not have ever actually been a de Grau, the heart of his story starts right here and ends up there. Shall we ascend? Camel's hump. Let's go get this treasure. You know, over the years, Camel's hump has gone by many names. Yeah, the Native Americans referred to it as Saddle Mountain. And Samuel Champlain's explorers called it Lion Couchant. Uh, and there was a historical map from the end of the 1700s uh, by Ira Allen that referred to it as Camel's Rump. Uh, but Camel's Hump as it exists now is a 20,000 acre state park covered with hiking trails and scenic overlooks. And the summit has been a destination 
since people first laid eyes on its unusual shape. So we're about halfway or so, and we just spotted one of these. People call these native trail markers, but I don't know. Maybe today we'll call it the treasure marker. Let's point it up. Well, we're up in the conifers now. We can see our breath. A little ways to go. But we still have plenty of daylight, plenty of time to search for treasure. We'll stay as long as it takes. Man, that view is absolutely it's Out stunning. of this world. <laughs> yeah. We've had to come down off the top out of the wind. It's freezing cold up there, but you can see in miles in every direction. We could see Lake Champlain where we were standing earlier today. Incredible. But we're here to find some buried treasure. With such little information, we really have to put ourselves in the shoes of the explorers that came here first. Right. Where would we hide the treasure? Right. And in the time of the explorers, Samuel Champlain called this mountain Lion Couchant, or Resting Lion, after the classic heraldry image. And if it were us, where would we bury it so that we'd be able to find it years later or tell someone else how to find it? What part of the lion would we bury it under? If it was up to me, yeah. I'd say right under the head. Me too. Let's hike down to below where the head would be and take a look around. Well, we have somehow found our way down below the head of the lion. It took us much longer than we expected. As you can probably see behind us, the sun is setting. We're already walking out in the dark, so we're gonna spend as long as we can looking around for a depression. My thought is if they buried a chest two centuries ago, perhaps it's caved in by now, there'll be a slight depression for a place for us to dig. I agree. We've got a metal detector, we've got a probe, Let's find the treasure. So, we have not gotten any hits on the metal detector, but I stuck this probe down in the ground. There is a little bit of depression here. It doesn't quite feel like a rock. It's kind of soft. I think we should dig. Yeah, check it out. All right, let's get a shovel. In the winter of 1826, a group of men were discovered searching for the Camel's Hump treasure, and this event was outlined in the Argus and Patriot newspaper, July 7th, 1880. May Martin, or the Money Diggers, written by D.P. Thompson, is known to have been founded upon fact, and men since have actually dug for the money. December 11th, 1826, between 8 and 9 o'clock in the evening, seven men, led by Ira McElroy, started for Camel's Hump with a view to discover what they could of the work or object of the money diggers there. They were accompanied by a justice of the peace who went to act as an official if any arrests should be made. The digging was said to be done at the foot of a nearly perpendicular drop of a hundred feet or more from the southerly part of the highest peak. 
They arrived in the early break of day at the headquarters of the Money Diggers. They found there Rodney Clogston, who was the leader of the band, a man named Shackford, one named Eastman, and one named Frizzell. These men were all up and dressed, and had a good fire burning a little outside of the walls of the shanty they built there as a living quarters. After taking breakfast, which was well washed down, the whole party commenced a thorough search which continued till about 1 o'clock p.m. and resulted in finding nothing except a little digging done inside of the shanty in the ledge that formed one of the sides. After giving up the searching, the party all came together at the camp and had a social time until some were feeling pretty well. Then some of the boys, being possessed by evil spirits as well as good, commenced to break spruce twigs and put them on the fire for the fun of seeing them burn. The invaders commenced piling on larger brush and soon had the shanty in a rousing blaze that shot in the air some 50 feet, making a splendid sight. Before the fire reached any of their things, they made a rush, saved their trumpery, and let the shanty burn. Thus ending the digging for Captain Kidd's buried treasure on Camel's Hump. Despite our best efforts, the search beneath Lion's Head on Camel's Hump was unfruitful. We did not locate the treasure. Now, is that because Rodney Clogston and his fellow treasure hunters removed it in 1826? Or maybe Ira McElroy and his band of seven burned down the shack and took it for themselves? Or maybe the treasure is still out there. Or maybe it never existed at all. In any case, it's been nearly two years since we first started looking for the Vault of De Grau. We scoured Chaos Canyon, we scaled Hell's Half Acre, and we ascended the Lion Kushan on Camel's Hump. And over the last two years, we tried our hand at prospecting, caving, gold panning, we used dowsing rods, and we even spoke to a psychic. We used every tool at our disposal, conventional or not, to no avail. We started with just a fragment of a legend that Eddie overheard over a decade ago and followed that tale down the rabbit hole to discover what we believe may be the source of the myth of De Grau. To the best of our discovery, the timeline played out as follows. At the end of the 1600s, Captain Kidd, who was a real person and a story for another day, buries actual treasure on Long Island, which inspires a flurry of treasure myths and treasure hunters across the East Coast. A century later, in 1826, Rodney Clogston and the Camel's Hump Diggers are discovered searching for a piece of Kid's treasure. Now, in my opinion, it's unlikely Kid made it this far inland, but that was what they were reportedly searching for. Less than 10 years later, in 1835, May Martin or the Money Diggers was first published. And although the author would later go on to say the story was based on Canadian adventurers traveling up Lake Champlain with Spanish treasure, it was more likely inspired by those 1826 events on Camel's Hump. D.P. Thompson could likely see the 50-foot fire from his house, and after all, he was a fiction writer. In any case, the May Martin story became incredibly popular, and it spread across the globe not only as a novel, but also in theater. Five years later, in 1840, Simeon Corser inexplicably arrived in Bristol, searching for the treasure at the behest of a soothsayer who resided in Canada. Yeah, and it's unclear exactly what treasure he was searching for, perhaps a piece of kids, or maybe he took Mae Martin a little bit too seriously. During this time, author Franklin Harvey was a child in Bristol, and then 50 years later, in 1888, he writes The Money Diggers, outlining the efforts of Simeon while also including many, many elements of Mae Martin, essentially combining the two stories. Now this is the first mention of anyone named De Grau, and probably stems from the May Martin character, Mr. Gow. The blending of these many tales continued over the next century, being retold and embellished countless times in newspapers and books. Finally on the internet, where I read a version of the tale that describing it as Lost Money Cave in the early 2000s. So, the search is over. De Grau never existed, and his treasure, just a fairy tale. You know, as I've said, I went into this 
as a skeptic. I've been preparing myself from the very beginning for the disappointment of not finding the treasure. But I gotta say, I'm even more disappointed now knowing that the treasure just never existed at all. The lore of a hidden chest in the Vermont mountains filled with silver is so exciting. The tale has been retold across folklore all over our state, and it's rather disappointing that the tale could not be true. And that's why we've taken it upon ourselves to hide our own. We melted down over a thousand dollars of silver bullion, poured it into bars, placed them in a chest and hid it away somewhere in the Vermont mountains. All the information you need to find it is hidden somewhere in these eight episodes of Finding the Vault of DeGrau. And so the legend lives on. Good luck. Good luck.